Welcome to the Corellis CAS 1000 I2C Bus Analyzer online demonstration. In this demonstration, you will learn about the capabilities and features of the CAS 1000 product. This demonstration lasts approximately 30 minutes. On the front of the CAS 1000 are four connectors. The RJ45 connector marked Serial Bus is the main interface between the target I2C bus and the CAS 1000 analyzer. There are also two SMB type connectors marked AT1 and AT2. These connectors can be used as fully voltage programmable input or output signals that can be used in conjunction with I2C analysis. They can also be used as an input trigger to the analyzer or as an output trigger to synchronize data with external test equipment. The last connector is a 20-pin header which can be used as an IEEE 1149.1 JTAG test access port to be used in boundary scan testing and in-system programming of flash, double EEPROM, and CPLD devices. Some of the general features of the CAS 1000 include a non-intrusive monitor mode with simultaneous waveform and list views for both state and timing analysis. In this mode, the CAS 1000 is able to detect and display all I2C traffic including I2C protocol violations. Both 7-bit and 10-bit addressing are supported. The software interface provides message filtering, triggering operations, and symbol decoding, including SMBus. Captured traces can be saved or loaded at any time. The CAS 1000 can be operated as a master or slave I2C device and can even be used as both a master and a slave simultaneously. The CAS 1000 can provide programmable pull-up resistors as well as programmable voltage levels on the clock and data signals and can drive the clock up to 5 MHz speeds in master mode. The Windows software is provided along with the hardware to give a total monitoring and exercise solution. Users can even interface their own test executives by using the included DLL. When the I2C Exerciser software is first launched, a splash screen will appear indicating the software version. After the splash screen, the software will try to detect a connected CAS 1000 unit. If a CAS 1000 unit is not detected, the software will display a pop-up message indicating that demo mode will be entered. This demo mode allows users to familiarize themselves with the various software features without actually having the CAS 1000 hardware present. It is also possible to manually enter demo mode even if the CAS 1000 hardware is detected. Under the tools menu there is a selection for demo mode. The status bar on the bottom of the software will report whether it is running in demo mode. Once the software loads and enters demo mode, the software monitor window is displayed. There are two main areas in the monitor window, the list view and the waveform view. In demo mode, the CAS 1000 software can simulate capturing a real trace by clicking the Run Single button. Once the Run Single button is clicked, a Run Status window will appear which displays the current operation status of the trace. Here the window shows it was capturing pre-trigger data, then received the trigger, followed by post-trigger data. The buffer was filled and the capture was completed. A total of 109 transactions were collected. Using the vertical scroll bar, I can display on the screen each of the data segments surrounding the trigger point. Here is the pre-trigger data. The actual trigger point is displayed in a different color here. And finally, the post-trigger data follows until the last transaction is displayed. At the bottom of the monitor window, the waveform view shows the actual patterns of the SCL and SDA signals and works very much like an oscilloscope. I can change the time scale to zoom in or zoom out. There are also two cursors, A and B, which I can move through the waveform and use them to determine the relative time between the two points. The two views correlate with each other, so if I click on a transaction in the list view, the waveform view will be updated to the current list location. Likewise, if I enter a line number in the waveform view and press enter, the list view will jump to the appropriate transaction. 
I am able to adjust the list view columns to any preference by reordering them or removing them from the view altogether. To return them to view, right click on a column heading and select the trace layout command. Each column heading has different right click parameter options as well. For example, the timestamp can be set from nanosecond resolution to seconds resolution, as well as absolute or relative indication. The address and data columns have the ability to have symbols displayed instead of the hex, decimal, or binary values. It is also possible to display the data column in normal mode, compact mode, or SMBUS mode. There are several icons which allow me to jump to specific locations in a trace. Moving the mouse over the icons reveal tool tips. I can jump to the trigger point, go to a tagged row, go to the start or end of a trace, or even jump to a cursor A or B. A list transaction can be tagged or untagged by either double clicking it or by right clicking on the appropriate transaction and selecting the set tag or clear tag option. Typically, there are several ways to perform the same task, using either icons, menus, or right-clicking specific areas, so keep this in mind while you're using the tool. For the remainder of the demo, I'm going to switch from demo mode to live mode. There will be a pause while the CAS 1000 unit is detected. Notice that the bottom status bar has switched from demo to live. In the I2C Exerciser software, there is a shortcuts toolbar which allows quick access to the different tools available. Now let's go ahead and move to the next tool available on the CAS 1000, the debugger. The debugger window will pop up which displays two columns outlined as send and receive. Notice the menus and toolbar icons have changed because the debugger window is now being accessed. In the debugger tool, the CAS 1000 only operates in master mode. This allows the CAS 1000 to send and receive messages from slave devices. There are two drop-down menus in each section. One is to set the address using either hex numbers or symbols, and the other is to specify the address format being either 7-bit or 10-bit. In the send box, there is a third drop-down menu to specify how many times to loop a script. In the Receive box, the third drop-down menu specifies how many bytes of data to read. Each section can be executed by pressing the Send or Receive buttons respectively. The last item is the No Stop checkbox, which specifies whether to send a stop condition at the end of a message. When unchecked, the stop condition is included after all of a message's data bytes have been written. Checking this box causes the stop condition to be omitted. Under the I2C bus protocol, absence of the stop condition means that a master is not yet done transmitting. The debugger tool also allows the creation of simple scripts. I will now load the tutorial script that comes with the I2C exerciser software using the open icon. The, tutor the tutorial script has now loaded. Here we can see that the first command is to send an address 2a hex followed by the data 33 hex. The script then pauses for half a second before continuing to send a second address 18 hex followed by two data bytes ff and 00 hex. Again the script pauses for half a second and finally sends a final address byte c4 hex followed by a data stream of four bytes. There are a total of 10 combined transactions in this script. Before we actually run this script, let's go ahead and make sure that our monitor tool is set up correctly to capture traffic. I will click back to the monitor tool and then click the Run Single button. Now I will click back to the debugger tool and click the Send button in the debugger window. I will now stop the monitor and close the monitor status window. Notice the receive window in the debugger tool shows the data bytes coming back. This is because there is an echo option enabled in the software preferences which ensures the master reads itself back. I will talk about this preference and others later during this demonstration. Now let's take a look at the monitor window data. 
At the top of the trace is our first transaction, which is the first address of the script. In this case, it is 2A hex. This is followed by a data transaction where the data is 33 hex. The script then halts for half a second as the timestamp clearly shows. The second address is then captured followed by two data transactions. Another half second delay takes place after which the final set of script address and data is captured. In this case, the address is C4 hex and the four data bytes are 21, 30, 0D and 0A hex. The script then ends up looping five more times so the monitor captured a total of 50 transactions. The next tool I will talk about in the I2C Exerciser software is the Serial EEPROM Programmer. The programmer interface provides a simple graphical environment allowing users to read, verify, erase, and program Serial EEPROM devices. Serial EEPROM manufacturers like Atmel, Microchip, and Zycor are fully supported. To demonstrate, first I will select the target device. In this case, I have a target board using an Atmel AT24C04. The I2C address for this device is A0 hex. There is currently data residing in the serial EEPROM. Clicking the read button allows me to view its contents. The address selection buttons are used to maneuver through the memory locations. I will now erase the contents of the serial EEPROM by clicking the Erase button. Notice that the contents of the serial EEPROM have been erased. I will now load a sample data file which contains 256 bytes. The I2C Exerciser software supports several data file formats including Intel Hex, Motorola S-Record, Binary, and TextBase Hex. It is also possible to use an offset to program the data into specific areas of the serial EEPROM device. By clicking the Program button, the serial EEPROM contents are written with the data file I selected. By reading the serial EEPROM again, notice the first 256 bytes are now programmed. The programmer tool also allows the ability to dump the contents of the memory to a file. This can be performed from the file menu by selecting Dump Data. One of the more powerful features of the cas 1000 e product is the ability to emulate master and slave I2C devices. The CAS1000 can emulate a single master and up to 10 slave devices while simultaneously capturing bus traffic in the monitor window. Each slave device can be assigned its own unique address. Accessing the emulation tool from the shortcuts toolbar brings up the emulation manager window. The Emulation Manager window provides an overview of all emulated devices. Each line in the listing shows the features of an independent emulation item under the column headings. Adding a virtual master or slave device is quite simple. Clicking the Add button pops up a dialog box which provides parameters for selecting a master or slave device, the device name, and the device address. Emulation is completely script-based. Bus master scripts are complete programming sequences that can include conditional branching to schedule complex behavior of bus interactions. While slave scripts are much more basic, since their main activity is to respond to bus master reads with sequential values and simply acknowledge any writes. Scripts are saved to the local hard disk and are loaded using the Browse button. Each script can be looped for a specific number of times, with the script or data sequences being restarted each time they are finished. I will now add a master device which simulates reading an I2C serial EEPROM device. As the CAS1000 only supports a single master, the name, address, and address type fields remain fixed and cannot be changed. The master device is now added to the emulation manager window. I will also add two slave devices to simulate the actual I2C serial EEPROM device the master will read from. I will set the first slave device at address A0 hex and the second slave device at address A2 hex. 
both slave devices are now added to the emulation manager window. The CAS 1000 is now ready to simulate both master and slave devices. By highlighting the master device and clicking the view button, the I2C exerciser software will jump to an emulated master window. This window provides a debugger interface with the ability to edit a script, run a script, step through a script, set breakpoints and bookmarks, and even check script syntax for errors. The slave data files can also be viewed in a similar manner. Returning to the Emulation Manager window and double-clicking on a slave data file will open the slave data file window. Here we are able to view or modify the slave data contents. Before we actually run the script, let's go ahead and make sure that our monitor tool is set up correctly to capture traffic. I will return to the monitor tool and click the Run Single button. I will now go back to the Emulation Manager window and run the script. While the script is executing, the bottom of the emulated master window fills with the return data of the emulated slave devices. The master script has completed, so I will now stop the monitor and close the monitor status window. By selecting the emulated master window, we can see that the script output window has been updated with the data read back from the emulated slave devices. The monitor window has also captured all the bus traffic of our emulated master and slave devices. This completes the emulation portion of this demonstration. The parameter scope window provides access to a variety of target I2C bus measurements. Using this tool, electrical characteristics of the bus can be quickly collected along with the timing characteristics of target, master, and slave devices. All of the measured parameters can be compared to minimum and maximum values stored in a specification file, resulting in a basic pass or fail indication of whether the bus parameters fell within the specified limits. The CAS 1000 I2C analyzer has a 512 sample measurement buffer and runs at a sample rate of 50 MHz. This provides approximately 10 microseconds worth of analog data for measurement. There are several parameters which can be measured. These include system parameters such as data and clock reference voltages, pull-up resistances, peak voltages, and signal capacitance, master parameters such as start hold times, start and stop setup times, data hold and setup times, bus idle times, clock frequency, clock periods, as well as clock and data rise and fall times. And finally, slave parameters like data hold and setup times, as well as rise and fall times. When the parameter scope window is first open, the measurement values are loaded from the parameter specification file called parameterspec.ini, located in the I2C Exerciser installation folder. This file is in a text format and can be opened with any text editor in order to customize the specifications. The right side of the parameter scope window contains a listing of measurable parameters. It displays the actual measured value along with the minimum and maximum restrictions and whether the measurement passed or failed. System master and slave measurements can be taken. To take a measurement, simply press the Measure button. Note that the master and slave measurements require bus activity, while the system measurement requires no bus activity. The actual measurements are sampled and updated. In this case, each parameter passed because it was either within the maximum and minimum limits, or no limits were specified. The left side of the parameter scope window contains a waveform graph that enables various signal edge transitions to be viewed after measurements have been performed. Beneath the graph are controls allowing specific edge transitions to be captured and displayed. There is a drop-down menu which allows the selection of different edge transition data for display in the graph. A special entry in the drop-down menu labeled User Triggered selects the data that is captured using the waveform trigger setup controls beneath the graph. Different trigger parameters are available for the data and clock signals such as triggering on the rising or falling edge, 
triggering either early or late position in the graph, as well as triggering on different bus cycles. I will go ahead and arm the graph and rerun the emulated master script. This time I have set the master this time, I have set the master to continue looping. The, param the parameter scope graph now displays the analog clock and data signals from the trigger point. The emulated master is still looping in the background. By rearming the trigger, the graph is updated with a new capture. Another high-powered feature of the CAS1000-E is a script-driven bus tester. The test tool allows testing of the I2C bus to make sure that it performs within desired limits by making go-no-go -no -go decisions about performance characteristics. The test mode is a superset of the Bus Master emulator feature with additional capabilities specifically designed for running acceptance test procedures in engineering or production environments. Test mode features include invoking bus parameter measurements, comparing measured bus characteristics against expected values, reporting runtime status messages to the user to show progress, consolidating findings to make a pass-fail indication, providing an emulated slave environment to aid in target evaluation, and even manipulating and sensing the I.O. bits to coordinate testing with target states or external test equipment. I will now load a sample script provided with the CAS1000 software. This sample script shows how to perform bus parametric testing and displays the test results to the output window. The script syntax is generally a subset of the C programming language. Script command files are comprised of variables, statements, commands, operators, calls to user-defined functions, and even comments. They are organized into callable functions, with the top entry level being the mandatory main function. Full details of the scripting language are available in the CAS1000 user's manual. The debug capabilities explained earlier in the emulation tools are also available in the test window. I, I will now run this sample script. Notice, notice the output window presents the measurement information. Other acceptance test scripts, such as this one, can be ran within the CAS1000 exerciser software or by interfacing with the available DLL to third-party test executives. I will now explain some of the other features available in the CAS1000 software. There are several preferences available under the Tools menu which allows you to customize the monitor window colors, set up monitor options, set up debugger options, set up programmer options, and change the address format. There is also a Configuration Manager which allows users to set customized triggers, display or exclude specific information in the monitor window using filters, Create symbols for address and data. Specify SM bus associations. Automatically detect target slave devices. Configure CAS1000 electrical settings. Customize where project files are stored. And even add timing skew by adjusting setup and hold times. This concludes the online demonstration of the CAS1000 I2C bus analyzer. If you would like further information on this product, please contact Corellis at www.corellis.com.